With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, it's been a minute. She hadn't been here since March. Thrilled to have her back, our friend from over in the UK. Alice Watson Brown has returned to Herd Tell. How are you, ma'am? Glad to have you back. I'm really well, thank you. I'm fresh out of university. I finished my degree and uh, just kind of recover from it and have a good summer and just chill out, I think. Yeah, it's got to be a good feeling, doesn't it? Um, yeah. While we're on the subject, we talk about uh, people moving around the UK. Y'all got yourself a rail strike going on. Uh, for the American audience, because the culture is different, mass transit is a much bigger deal in the UK than it is here, because we're such a much bigger country, more spread out. Uh, there's two sides to these things, of course. There's the practical side and there's the political side. Just give us both. Practically, what is this rail strike doing? And politically, what is happening with it? Well, practically, um, it's stopping millions of people from getting around the country and getting to work. And it is basically a protest in the context of inflation, cost of living, the fact that public sector workers in the UK haven't received a pay rise in line with this huge, you know, this the inflation crisis, uh, whilst MPs seem to have increased their pay rise around two grand, I think, uh, in the last two years. So there's that kind of inequality. And then politically, in the UK, the trade unions uh, say we're going to strike we want the government to give us what we want. We want more rights for our workers. We want more pay for our workers. And it's it's basically trying to emotionally blackmail the government through, you know, emotive language in the way that, you know, it's workers versus, you know, the the elite and the state. It's this, you, you can tell what their political motivation is. Um, and it's incredibly disruptive. Whether you support it or deny it, no one can say that it's not disruptive. Um, and what's interesting, though, is that people usually, if you a rail strike pre-COVID um, would happen, people would be mad taking taxis everywhere. This, everyone would be walking to work, cycling to work. But now you walk through the streets and it's really empty because people have started working from home. And especially it's a really sunny week. People don't want to be going to the office. They'll just say, I'm just going to work from home. I mean, my family have done that. Um, so whether the effect it has is going to be as widespread and as sort of felt by the consumer this time is up for debate. Um, but the popularity of commuting by car and working from home, as I said, could well see passengers now just desert railways and never to return, especially given that you know they're not nationalized in the UK. So prices can really vary um you can pay 200 pounds to get a train to edinburgh in scotland when it's cheaper to fly there via paris it doesn't make sense yeah and of course the backdrop here is interesting and the timing is really interesting because you have you know front page of the times today uk inflation hits 40 year high uh cost of living is dominating the headlines it uh dominated prime minister questions this morning uh, th this is something that's affecting absolutely everybody. So the question, of course, is, and I'm not against unions as a rule, but uh, strikes are about timing and strikes are about public sentiment. That's really what a strike is for. Everybody's hurting right now. This may not be the time to fly that flag of, hey, we want a little extra when these folks are probably doing just a little bit better than folks in the Midlands or in the outs parts of the country where, number one, this doesn't affect them as much. And number two is they're going to watch it on TV and go, what are they thinking? Everybody's hurting here. Is that fair or is that the common sentiment? I think there's, I think that is definitely one way of looking at it. And in a way you you could be right. However, I think they have timed it possibly quite well because there is, everyone is hurting right now, as you said. And what better way to go up against the government and all this inflation and this, this grievance than to support a very disruptive anti-government protest and it's not just the rail strikers the, the rail workers and their, their strike teachers are threatening to strike nurses like nurses so all across the public sector there is this this you know they want to 
there's this impediment between the rulers and the workers. Um, but I suppose one way you could spin this, which a lot of people might disagree, is that this could be good for Prime Minister Johnson because it distracts himself, it distracts the press anyway from anything to do with Partygate, anything to do with the latest palaver with his wife, Carrie Johnson, um, anything, any misdemeanors in his office that have really um, undermined uh, opinion of him, spe spe specifically within the Conservative Party. Um, so maybe this could be a uniting factor for the Conservatives and, you know, take tension away from, you know, the leadership election and the vote of no confidence. It depends on how he handles it. And currently how he's handling it is ostracizing the leader of the opposition. So Sakir Starmer of the Labour Party and the Labour Party um, is the most interesting. I personally think it's the most interesting party in, in the UK. They are they used to be the parties of the trade unions there leadership elections, their internal structure used to be so heavily dominated by the trade unions uh, and, and their leaders and how they could really choose which leader got elected and how much influence they had in, in drafting policies. And Sakir Starmer hasn't said anything. He hasn't been clear about it. And the fact that he's not made a clear stand when his MPs are out there on the picket lines really speaks about the state of the Labour Party right now. So Johnson really could use this as it is as to, to his advantage to present a you know united conservative government let's talk about those labor folks for a minute because um now i'm an american so just go real slow and use small words explain this to me maybe when you put the u in labor it changes things but we had a really interesting scene with the labor party where you have Keir Starmer and the leadership and the front bench telling the back bench that they shouldn't be seen on the picket lines. Yeah. Now, I'm not exactly a labor supportive, but if you're the labor party and there's a labor strike, that seems like something that would be in your wheel. I, I just kind of shook my head. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. What, what are they doing over there? <laughs> it's a symptom of a wider identity crisis within the labor party of this country. And I think social democracy in general, um, obviously, Labour had its great sort of decline and fall um, after, you know, Gordon Brown and, and the, finan the financial crisis when, you know, I, I don't know if you know the term Keynesian economics um, in, yeah, so that was sort of the alternative economic model to capitalism or, or, or neoliberalism and Keynesian sort of, Keynesianism fell and sort of Tony Blair created this third way and that obviously built a rift between the more traditional Labour supporters and Tony Blair also did try, didn't try to incorporate trade union influence into his party. He didn't um, redact the infamous policies of Mrs. Thatcher um, regarding their ability to strike. And since then, they've had no economic policy that can appeal in the way capitalism does. Um, and they've also got this legacy of just being bad with the economy. Um, they always have. They always seem to screw it up. Um, you know, you can't just tax and spend. People understand that now. Um, and there's as well as this now in this age of identity politics, there is this very common question now that I would say more right wing commentators always ask Labour MPs when they come on air, they go, can you define a woman? And most of them can't answer. Most of them can't answer. And that's driven away a lot of people. It, it, it's fundamentally a crisis of identity. This um, writer called Patrick Diamond has written far better than I can explain and in depth on this. So if you want to know more, do, do look him up. He's, he's very good at that, uh, explaining why. Yeah, it's a uh, universal problem. We're having the same thing over here with our, you know, even inside our Democratic Party, which is our left yeah. party, you have the, the center left. And then you have the social democratic wing that's yeah. getting more and more progressive and they <laughs> never the twain will meet apparently, except when there's an election to be had, it's the same thing. And it's more social and economic stuff. It's kind of, it's really interesting how universally, how much of this, since you brought it up, how much of this falls on Keir Starmer? Now to be fair to the labor party, they've bounced back from the, from the Corbyn years and the disaster that that was, they did decently well in the recent local elections. They did pretty well, especially in London, places like this. So it's not the house on fire, but at the same time, a lot of people are looking at all the problems Boris Johnson's having and then looking at their own side up front and going, man, we should we should be doing better than this against what Boris Johnson's doing. 
a lot of labor folks have been saying those sorts of things. Is that all far on Keir Starmer or is Boris Johnson just that Teflon? Where's the mix of those two meet? I think Sakir Starmer um, hasn't been a force of personality. He hasn't brought a spark or a fire um, to the way he speaks. He keeps missing open goals. There were so many to so many criticisms that he could have weaponized during COVID. Um, and I think that was a big thing for his leadership. People didn't know what he stood for, apart from just saying, oh, this policy is too late or this policy is wrong without actually saying what he would bring to the table. Um, but you could argue that, um, you know, in this sort of economic situation, especially, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, a leader like that, a figurehead, who, a motive, you know, po populist figurehead could be what Labour would need to win an election. Not that I'm saying, you know, it, it would be it would be good, but I think he weaponized the anti-austerity narrative incredibly well. He mobilized the youth vote incredibly well. Um, and it doesn't look like Starmer really is doing that at the moment. Um, obviously, we're regarding the cost of living and things like that. He's not stirring the masses in the way that Labour can. And um, as we were going back to the identity crisis, this it, it's happened throughout Europe in their social democratic parties as well. And it's it's a trend. It's a very interesting trend to see, you know, since 2008, um, all these, yeah, these social democratic parties in the center left kind of fracturing. And then I, I suppose with you as well, you, you have the Nancy Pelosi's and then you have the AOC's and um, they don't they don't necessarily mesh well but one of them has to catch up with the other at some point. Yeah, Allison Watson Brown joining us. Okay, so just how big an issue is the cost of living crisis? It's obviously, you know, front page, it's obviously dominating social media. You're there, we're not though. Turn the noise down on the news and tell us just on a practical level, is this what everybody in, in Britain and the UK is talking about? Is it is this the dominant issue of the time right now for folks over there? Yes, it's gone from changing the way you go to a supermarket, um, you know, I'm a student and notoriously I'm poor, right? And uh, my sort of 25 pound a week food budget was my big thing. Um, and it was my kind of, it was my shop. But now what I would have to do is just kind of fill my basket up with the essentials until I hit my, my budget mark. And then I just couldn't buy any more because that was it, right? And uh, luckily, I'm in a position where, you know, I have a very good home life and my parents were able to help me out a little bit. Um, but there are a lot of people who aren't. However, right now, the weather's hot. People are happy. People can go out and they don't need to worry about heating their homes because families are choosing between putting the heater on and putting meals on the table, which is horrible. And it's not just that it's it's petrol. It's, it's going places. And if people can't afford to go out and buy their Starbucks coffee because they have to save money or buy their, you know, buy their pastry on the way to work, that means the workers in those cafes and in those restaurants are losing out as well. It's a never ending cycle of, of pretty much just depression. Um, I suppose the news in some way is not doesn't necessarily over exaggerate this it's it's true you see it everywhere and it's, it's the supermarkets especially um are all competing on their um you know get save money on this on this deal on that deal um and there was this huge um huge story about the government were going to ban two for one or buy one get one free on ready meals in their tackle to you know in their aim to tackle child obesity and they uh decided not to go forward with that in the cost of living crisis because you know any food's food right you need to feed your kids and yeah some people don't have a choice and um you know <laughs> uh it, it caused a lot of backlash but actually sadly that's what we've we that's come to um but yeah that that's from my perspective as a young person and even more annoyingly, um, I coming from London, you now have to pay like seven pounds fifty for a pint of lager, and it doesn't make going out that fun. Yeah, that's ten bucks for uh, those of you from Logan that aren't up on the uh, pound sterling conversion to U.S. Yeah. dollars. That's that's an expensive drink. Uh, Alice Watson Brown. One last political question, and we're going to switch gears. Um, Boris Johnson. Uh, he he seems to just 
oh, it's over. Oh, it's not over. Oh, it's over. It's not over. Now we had the Lord Gate thing. We've had the ethical stuff. We've had the, the carry stuff over the last week or so. Uh, but he doesn't seem like he's really going to be going anywhere. I know there's a, a little bit of election fatigue. There's no clear-cut replacement for him. Those factor in as well. He just keeps squiggling out of these tight spots and pressing on ahead. It, it's kind of remarkable to watch, really, isn't it? I think the last point that you said is probably the most influential of the fact why he's still there. There is no real alternative replacement to Boris Johnson. There's no real forefronter. I mean, there are whisperings about it. MPs, sort of red wall anti-lockdown MPs. So people like Steve Baker, who wanted to leave the lead the COVID recovery group, but their only political message is, you know, I was against lockdown. There's no kind of philosophy about them as there is with Boris Johnson. Um, and I think also Ukraine, he's been praised personally by Zelensky for, you know, our solidarity and our rate our help for them but he you know I guess he he just keeps seems to keep going and um whilst I've fallen out of love with him many many times um I I I would see no one else who I would vote for um but he doesn't Boris Johnson is a man who is desperate to be liked and if he left office he wouldn't leave office in a crisis he would leave because he he wasn't elected if that makes sense yeah it does one of our uk friends kind of put it this way he because i asked him how bad it, we, we knew the we knew the party gate picture was eventually going to show up because that's just the world we live in and he he kind of made it half joking but it turned out too he's like that that view of him walking through kiev outweighed that party gate picture he's like you yeah. watch and sure enough it did he was right all right alice watson brown we're going to switch gears we've been banging on the brits a little bit it's her turn. She's going to take a shot at our government and specifically the FDA. We'll talk a little America with our friend Alice Watson Brown over in the UK, late of Bristol, but she's done with them now. We'll be right back. More her tell right after this. to her tell alice watson brown has returned to the program after far too long of a break we'll make sure it's sooner when you come back next time okay your turn you get to take some shots at us uh the fda now the fda got a lot of uh, press the last few years because of covid and things like that but their main job of regulatory stuff you touched in on it you've been talking about smoking you've got a piece out at center square talking about it this has just been their bugaboo for about pretty much my whole adult lifetime. Since you know, I was born in the 80s, so the last 30, 40 years specifically, it's just been a war on smoking and smokers. You're writing about it. Now we've gotten in it, and Joe Biden's been talking about this too, the methanol ban, and now they're talking about the age ban. Um, smoking's way down in America. Why is this still such a priority for the FDA? Uh, because the FDA seems to be confusing public health and politics again and again, as do many other uh, health. No, uh, you don't say. Political health organizations. And it's strange. I don't know why it's such a trend. Um, it's their priority because smoking and, well, yeah, drinking and doing bad stuff to your body of your own volition is the one thing that the government have not yet been able to properly control because it is something that is truly down to human agency and not the state. And it's same with the war on vaping. And this whole ridiculous thing about controlling people's perception of risk. And that is not human. That, that is not how humans function. Um, and so, the, and the problem that I really can't stand is that with these policies like the menthol ban, the vaping ban, uh, and things like that, is that it's done 
using the, prete the, the pretense that it's protecting minorities. It is done saying, oh, it's going to help women. It's going to help LGBTQ plus people. It's going to help race equality. And it's like, okay, so you're going to criminalize something, which a lot of minorities do, mainly African-Americans, uh, whilst you're in an incarceration crisis, of which African-American citizens are overly represented. It is that that doesn't make sense and you're also on, it's just not on a human level this is it, it's on an economic level it, it stumps innovation in the sector um and and it stunts you know informed knowledge and it's having smoked from a young age i went to a boarding school in the middle of the countryside and it was sort of the only thing we were able to do to try and have some fun um i quit using vaping and you know flavored alternatives that were tobacco uh, you know smoke free and uh, without that i would not have quit and i'm thankful for for you know the wonders of innovation for helping me do that but people do not quit smoking because their moms or the government tells them to they do it because they feel an innate need to better themselves and um the state of Colorado has, this is why I love America because you, you know, I love how you have separate governments that you can, it's an experiment and, you know, a, a lab test as I used to learn it as. Um, the state of Colorado also tried to do a, they've also issued a statement saying they want to ban menthols. And um, the, the projected damage to their economy could amount to, you know, $4.6 billion, you know, with 5,000 businesses who rely on the sale of these products as well as their consumers, you know, to be hit by this. And alternatively, people are just gonna be taken to the black market. So there are so many things wrong with the FDA's war on smoking and on alternatives. It just, you know, why don't you try and give people a little bit of a better life by empowering them, then they might be able to make some decisions about how, about their health and about their life. It, it just, it's nonsensical and i've always said it the thing to me and it, it, it the heavy handedness and the nonsensical uh bureaucracy of using a hammer to kill a fly for these things really becomes evident to me with the vaping thing because on one hand you're saying we're going to spend this massive amount of taxpayer money to get everybody to quit smoking and then on the other hand you're taking away the one thing that every smoker i've ever known that quit using it swears up and down is the best thing ever to get them to quit smoking and they're doing it at the same time and I understand the bureaucracy does that because that's how you get your funding and that's how you get your researching. That's how you get your budget items because you can do multiple things at once. But it's so nonsensical to say, OK, we're going to hammer people for smoking because of the health costs, whatever. OK, fine. Give them the alternative. Oh, no, we're going to ban the alternative at the same time. That's just so blatantly nanny state nonsense that I, I just don't know how it's even defensible other than the fact it's a line item in a budget for thousands and thousands of people. And that's the, the reason it keeps going, because I can't find any other better excuse for it, because yeah. even anti-smoking people are like, yes, vaping helps. I mean, it's the most helpful thing ever for these folks. It, I'm not usually a fan of, you know, binaries, but you cannot be... Um, anti-vaping but without being pro-smoking you you just can't and and that the fdi are trying to go along these two the fda sorry are going on these two parallel paths of policy that can never possibly meet and can never possibly be good for anyone and the vaping it's the honest thing they they want to follow the science but they won't follow the science that vaping is 99 percent safer or that the more you invest in companies which you know harm reduction initiatives the more businesses are going to innovate and provide new more accessible even safer products for people who want to quit and it's it's the same with the world health organization and it's what you were saying about funding is it's people like michael bloomberg who is a philanthropist and um has these companies called it's called campaign for tobacco free kids and this company is, guess what, funded by the World Health Organization. And it leads you in thinking it's trying to stop child poverty and things like that. But actually, it just, um, you know, pumps money, it blackmails poorer governments like Mexico to enact smoking bans. And, you know, in order to, they give them money uh, 
uh, to say, oh, you can spend this on healthcare if you if you ban this, if you ban vaping, because if you don't ban vaping, then we're not going to help you. And it's 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 awful. It's it's sort of corruption in that way. It's not only corruption, Alice Watson Brown joining us on her tail. It's not only corruption, it's incompetence. Because <laughs> we have we have evidence in recent memory of this. The World Health Organization, uh, Bloomberg and others, he's not the only one, he's just the biggest fish in the pond, so Bloomberg, the FDA. They spend all this bandwidth on this. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do understand that things don't happen in a vacuum, they happen in a sequence. So when you have something like COVID, where it was so mismanaged, and the corruption of the World Health Organization with China and other things, and you have the incompetence at the FDA, and you have people who needed to be able to believe in things like the like the FDA, like the National Health Institute, like whatever the equivalent, the NHS in England is the exact same thing in the UK. They need to be able to trust these folks. But even a major government bureaucracy only has so much bandwidth. You can't tell me when you're spending your resources and your time and your money and the public facing stuff at this because it's popular with certain folks. And then a pandemic hits and you're unprepared. I'm I'm going to judge you on that and go, well, maybe we should have spent more time on that that actually has a huge graphic, horrible body count to it instead mm. of this pet project thing that is more of a personal choice, even though we there's no smoker I've ever met in their life that doesn't know it's not bad for them. OK, yeah. right. But there's no way those two things aren't connected. And I, I know that's a little broad, but that's just the facts. You can't they need to spend time on things that matter. Like we just had a headline in the UK. Polio is back in the UK for the first time. Yeah, I just years. saw that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but, um, but that's the point, though. It's like maybe you should focus on actual public health stuff instead of political public health. That is a financial and political cudgel to go beat people over the head with. That would, you know, mistake that kind of thing. I would be knocked off my chair if that actually happened. Um, no, I agree. That's a lot of people say that it's con conspiratorial thinking to, you know, connect dots. And as I agree with you, I wouldn't say I'm a conspiracy theorist, but it has just seemed that in the last few years, there is just this kind of um, emerging battle against just personal choice with the most ridiculous ridiculous justifications for it and I don't I, I I'm, I'm worried in a way and I love the idea of the FDA of you know a, a health service for everyone and in a way a, a world you know a world health initiative so we can draw talent from all countries to to research and and help people all across the world that you can't no rational person can be against that right but this it's a very small amount of people who receive a very large amount of money who go, yeah, I'll try this just to see what happens. And I won't care about how many people it affects. And that is incomprehensible to me as to why this has been allowed to go on for so long. And as to why even a leader like, you know, Boris Johnson is still considering partnering with the World Health Organization and it, 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 it flabbergasts me. It does. Uh, we, we've public health has turned into a misnomer because there's not really anything public about it. It's just government that needs to be yeah. more accountable and unaccountable government is always going to be a mess, no matter what form it takes. Uh, Alice Watson Brown, outstanding stuff today. We'll link to your piece in the show notes. Like we always do. Uh, it's been too long, but until we get you back on again, which is not going to be four months, it'll be a lot faster this time. Mm -hmm. I promise. Uh, let folks know how they can keep up with you and what you got going on until they see you again. Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, <laughs> so until we get you back on, let folks know where they can follow you, your social media, and what you got going on until we see you again. Yeah, so uh, my Twitter handle is Alice Watson Brown, just at Alice Watson Brown, spelt A-L-Y-S. Um, and currently, I'm just going to be doing a lot of reading and I'll be writing more, appearing more on radios and stuff. So do give me a follow on Twitter as that is where I post most of my appearances. So, yep. And she teased us with this uh, garlic pesto thing a couple months ago and has abandoned oh, yeah. Twitter Supper Club since then. We need you back. We need our UK uh, branch of Twitter Supper Club to up I their will. game a bit. Yeah. Looking forward more to that. time to cook now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure talking to you. We'll make sure to put all your information for folks to follow you. Alice Watson Brown, outstanding job as always. Talk again soon, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.